And if I had been standing here 20 years ago, or indeed 10 years ago, I doubt very much uh, if the conversation we'd be having would be uh, really anything other than dominated uh, by the efforts to achieve uh, peace in Ireland, peace in Northern Ireland. But I'm just, uh, it's just a, a matter of enormous pride to me personally uh, and professionally to, uh, to be able to stand in front of, of you here in, in New Hampshire and indeed in any audience in the United States and to, to declare um, that Ireland today is a country at peace. Ireland is a country that enjoys, <laughs> that, that, that has secured peace through the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. Um, uh, it's in its 15th year, in fact, in the last um, uh, few weeks, few days indeed, we've had the 15th anniversary of that Good Friday Agreement, which brought peace to our island. And um, also it's extraordinarily important on these occasions to acknowledge uh, the role uh, that the United States itself played in the securing of that peace. Because uh, Ireland is a very small place. Um, uh, relations between Britain and Ireland uh, obviously were, were, were challenging over, over the period. And the truth of the matter is we could not have done it. We could not have achieved peace in Ireland without opening the window a little bit wider, uh, bringing in our friends from the United States with the agreement, of course, of the British government as well, uh, finally, and um, uh, enjoying the, um, uh, the opportunity that that presented to us uh, through the good offices of, of successive administrations, of course, uh, but in, at the crucial time, of course, the administration of President Clinton, uh, the role of Senator Mitchell, uh, who played such an extraordinary role uh, in bringing peace. So today, uh, um, uh, the, um, the Good Friday Agreement is in, uh, is in full effect. Um, um, the, the government of Northern Ireland is a government of partnership, uh, and uh, Northern Ireland is a place of peace. Uh, uh, the relations between Dublin and Belfast are better than they've ever been, and, and more particularly, uh, relations between our two islands, between the island of Britain and the island of Ireland, are at a level um, uh, of friendliness uh, that, has, uh, been, uh, that, that we've never enjoyed previously in our history. Uh, given expression uh, this time uh, two years ago uh, by the visit to Ireland, of course, of, of Queen Elizabeth II. Um, the first visit by um, a reigning British monarch uh, to Ireland in 100 years. Uh, so there's a good, very good reason why it took 100 years uh, for, a <laughs> for a reigning British monarch to visit Ireland, but the circumstances were right uh, through um, uh, the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement and through the achievement of peace in Ireland. The circumstances were right uh, two years ago, uh, such that the Queen uh, could visit uh, with all the appropriate um, um, you know, dignity that should attach to an occasion like that. And it's a very, very important, and was a very, very important, and is a very, very important capstone uh, on uh, the peace process and on the relationship um, that we now enjoy between our two islands. So that's a great success story, and it's a success story that's going to build into the future. We are partners together in assuring uh, that the peace that's, uh, that Northern Ireland enjoys today is a peace that's going to endure into the future, and that's something we're very, very proud of. There's work still to be done there. I mean, Northern Ireland is a very, very divided society. So um, while I convey a sense to you of, of great progress having been made, it is in a context where uh, it is a society that that remains fractured. We have agreement in place which gives a, 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 a capability or a capacity uh, for politics to, to function within that divided society uh, as fairly and as, effect and as effectively as we can. But it is a divided society and we, uh, by which I mean the Irish government, the British government, and of course our good friends in the United States need to continually um, assure and to monitor and uh, to give support uh, you know, to the continuing um, uh, good progress that we're making. It's very, very important. Never you know, not to give it that attention and that support into the future. In any event, it, that, so that's really is all I want to say about Northern Ireland for the moment. It's, uh, I say, it's, 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 it's a success story, uh, but it continues to be a work in progress, and we, 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 we appreciate your continuing support. But I'm delighted to be here this evening at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anthem's College. Uh, I'm so conscious of being in such a vibrant institution and in an historic college which ranks among uh, the very best. And looking around uh, these rooms and these corridors, you know, you do have a sense of extraordinary history uh, in this establishment here. And of course, there is already an indelible link between St. Alan's and Ireland through the co-founder of the college, Bishop Dennis Mary Bradley of Manchester, New Hampshire, who was born in Castle Island in County Kerry in 1846 and whose family emigrated here from the small island of Ireland to the United States when he was only eight years old. So this great college is therefore a further testament uh, to the extraordinary contribution of the Irish in every corner of America to the building of this nation and its wonderful institutions down through the generations. I know that it has been said that no one runs for president of the United States without speaking at St. Anselm's New Hampshire Institute of Politics. I understand that to be true. 
Presidential aspirants have thus stood here over the years and made their case and made this unique venue a vital part of the US political landscape. However, let me assure you tonight that my ambition does not extend to the presidency <laughs> of the United States. For the truth is that I could not be more privileged and fulfilled than I already am to represent my own country, the country of Ireland, as Ireland's ambassador to Washington DC and to all of these United States. But to be Ireland's ambassador to the United States also at this time when Ireland occupies the presidency of the Council of the European Union, the EU, is a particular honor indeed. Ireland, for those of you who know it, and perhaps for those of you who don't know it, is a proud and committed member of the 27 member countries that comprise, shortly to be 28 indeed when Croatia joins, of the member countries that comprise the European Union, which of course is the largest economy in the world. The EU is also, it needs to be acknowledged, and sometimes it's not fully acknowledged, is also the most successful peace process that the world has ever seen. And this was recognized, of course, by the award of last year's Nobel Peace Prize to the European Union. For the EU has created a level of cooperation between countries in Europe and indeed beyond that is simply unparalleled. For its part, you know your geography, Ireland is on the western edge of this European Union, very much part of it and very much at the heart of it and sees itself, while peripheral in its geography, very much at the heart of this union that we call the European Union. Our membership of the European Union is, of course, long-standing. We marked recently the 40th anniversary of Ireland's accession uh, to the European Union in, 19, in January 1973. And indeed, this is the seventh occasion that Ireland has led and held the presidency of the European Union since we joined that union some 40 years ago. Ireland also, of course, shares a common currency, the euro, with 16 other countries, member states of the European Union. Not all 27 countries share the euro, but 17 countries do share the euro, and Ireland is one of those countries, and importantly so. So we are deeply committed to the European Union and the euro's successful development. For the EU has transformed Ireland into a modern, dynamic economy, and the EU is also an accepted part of our domestic political landscape. So sometimes when you hear stories, particularly stories um, relating to Britain, our neighbor, obviously in relation to their view about Europe, it should never be confused with Ireland's view of Europe. Ireland is an, un uh, an unambiguous and committed and devoted member of the European Union, and we intend to remain so, not just of the Union itself, but also the currency of which we form part. It is absolutely clear to us that Ireland's long-term economic and political interests lie in a strong and cohesive European Union. At this point, coming towards the end of April, of course, Ireland is more than halfway to the current presidency of the European Union. We occupied this role for six months. It's a rotating presidency. We're in the driving seat at the moment. Everybody gets a chance, but the chance only comes up every 14 years with 28 member states. This is our chance to be in the driving seat. We're nearly halfway through it and doing our very best, obviously, to steer the business of the European Union forward in every way that we can. And just to let you know, on the last occasion that we held this presidency in 2004, we, as Ireland, presided over the greatest ever expansion of our union, bringing in no less than um, all the new member states of Central and Eastern Europe, as well as Malta and Cyprus. Today, and in more recent years, a different set of new and demanding challenges have emerged in Europe relating to debt and banking that have stretched, of course, our European Union to its limits, and indeed also demanded urgent responses. As a consequence, we have even heard people say, not least here in the United States, and wondered whether indeed the European Union could and can survive, and indeed also whether the European currency could or can survive. But let me say this, as a member of the European Union and as a country which is part of the euro currency area, it is simply inconceivable, it is simply inconceivable to anybody who has any knowledge of the history of our continent, the continent of Europe, that the European Union or the euro could somehow fail. It is simply not going to happen. The EU is sometimes criticized for its response to the current crisis, 
and indeed from time to time, and indeed some people might say frequently, uh, the response has at times been hesitant and, and sometimes uh, ina inadequate. But also it needs to be said that the, the Union, with all its complexity, does not always get the credit for what it has done, what it is doing, or indeed fundamentally for what in fact it is. It is our belief that the EU is rising to the challenges that it faces. We are seeking to fix where we got things wrong, and there's a clear acknowledgement there that we have got things wrong and we need to fix them. But we're moving in a very determined way to ensure that our union, our currency, our banking system, our fiscal arrangements are where they need to be. So yes, there are challenges, but just to paraphrase the State of the Union here, the State of the Union, the European Union has improved and is, we believe, getting stronger. So take the meeting recently in February, in fact, of the heads of state and government of the European Union that met in Brussels to discuss the budget of the European Union, a highly complex um, uh, piece of, 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 of legislation. And they agreed, subject to the, agree the agreement of the European Parliament, the consent of the European Parliament, the budget of the European Union for no less than the next seven years. No small achievement among 27 countries, and a clear statement that the EU can act in a way that assures its future and secures the interests of the member states. You in this country and other countries know how complex it is to secure a budget. Um, I hardly need to remind you there, but I mean to secure a budget uh, for all 27 countries for not just one year, not just two years, but for seven years is an indication that Europe can do its business, is capable of doing its business, and on this occasion discharge that business in a pretty competent way. And it is, of course, a budget that complements the themes and focus of Ireland's own presidency of, uh, of the Union. And that theme, the theme of our presidency, not surprisingly, is a theme of stability, growth, and jobs, a focus that will help build a secure foundation for renewed economic growth and job creation across our Union, which is so desperately needed. So this EU budget is good for Europe. It's also good for Ireland. Ireland and Europe are thus working hand in hand, making progress together towards recovery. Because our European Union was hit particularly hard by the global economic downturn. There is no gilding the lily. There is no doubt that our Union was badly hit. Different countries, of course, in Europe face different problems, and some are less affected than our others. As an, but as an economic bloc, we are confident that we will emerge from this crisis stronger, more united, and more competitive than we ever were before. The crisis has indeed forced us, more than ever before, to reassess our economic policies, to fundamentally revise our public finances, and to deepen our economic and monetary union in Europe. But overall, our fundamentals remain strong. Let me give you some facts, if I may. Just in, case, in the relation to the state of New Hampshire, the European Union and the state of New Hampshire enjoy a trading relationship that amounts to more than $1.2 billion. It's not the biggest trading relationship we have, but it's not insignificant either. And in fact, 24% or thereabouts of all of New Hampshire's exports go to the European Union. So there's a direct relevance between what you're doing here, what you produce here, and where I represent as presidency of the European Union. Europe is also the largest economy in the world, as I said earlier, amounting to Euro, Euro 12.6 trillion, so 12.6 trillion euros with 500 million consumers. Just to compare that to the United States, the United States indeed is the only other entity in the world with a similar level of a similar economy worth about 11.3 trillion euro. Compare that to China, which is an economy worth 4.6 trillion euro. So you'll see that, you know, if Europe is 12, if the United States is 11, uh, China is 4, to give you a sense of the scale of what Europe is, and indeed, of course, also what the United States is, and to put that in perspective in relation to China as well. We have also managed to more than hold our own in the face of strong, very strong competition from emerging countries. Europe today, the Europe of 2013, has a manufacturing trade surplus of almost 200 billion euros, five times larger than it was in the year 2000. And sometimes people forget this. The fact is that Europe continues to increase its trade surplus, continues to manufacture very effectively and very progressively. And in fact, that trade surplus this year, as I said, amounts to something in the region of 200 billion euros. 
Euro, Europe also remains the world's largest importer of manufactured goods and as well as services. And not only do we have the largest stock of foreign direct investment abroad, in other words, foreign direct investment by Europe abroad is the biggest foreign direct investment by any entity abroad, we're also the largest host of foreign direct investment in the world in Europe. And if you compare, as we often do, public finances at the moment, if you compare overall public finances to those of the US and Japan, you come to some surprising conclusions. For in terms of debt to GDP ratio, the European average is about 82%. And even if this is too high, it is decidedly better than the United States, which is almost 103%, and Japan, whose debt is close to 230% of its GDP. So as I said earlier on, we're not delusional. We know we have difficulties. But I'm just trying to convey a sense that it's not all doom and gloom, even though in, in recent times, uh, the gloom has, has, has obviously been very much to the fore. But we truly believe that we're better equipped now today than we were before the storm struck three or four years ago. Indeed, we had to build a lifeboat in the middle of that storm. And while not entirely finished yet, we believe that this lifeboat is sufficiently strong now to face all headwinds. For its part, Ireland's own story within the European Union, following a period of extraordinary challenge, is indeed now one of recovery, and I'm proud to say that. Ireland is in the business of recovery, and we are also very much open for business. The problem of Ireland, as many of you may be familiar with, and I know some of you travel back and forth to Ireland, is familiar, and the prob our problems will be familiar to you. Our problem in Ireland was caused by our banks, essentially, and the bursting of a property bubble that saddled Ireland with extraordinary and large debt. The question of our banking debt is still the focus of a huge amount of attention in our country, with ongoing efforts to re-engineer this debt to achieve a more sustainable result, which we need to get. It is very, very important to us to separate banking debt from our sovereign debt. The so-called toxic link that exists between sovereign debt and national debt is something that we are absolutely determined to, to break, because all the debt that we acquired in bailing out our banks went on to our national debt somewhere, so a place where we don't think it properly resolve, it resides. Uh, and it needs to be separated out from our sovereign debt and put into a different space so that our sovereign debt better reflects the strength of our economy. Our EU partners recognize this, and they recognize that Ireland is indeed a special case. And we hope, therefore, that the banking debt issue can be re-engineered and will be re-engineered in a way that will make it more sustainable into the future. But crucially, in the meantime, we are fulfilling all of our obligations under the 2010 IMF, EU, ECB, European Central Bank bailout program and bringing our fiscal house into line. For those of you who know uh, what we had to do back in 2010, Ireland faced the ignominious position of having uh, to seek the, the, the support and the, um, of external partners, the European Central Bank, the IMF, and the, um, the European Union because essentially we were shut out of the bond market. We couldn't borrow money in our own capacity because the international uh, lending community had lost confidence in our capacity to do all that. So we had to get the help of others, something that no country um, ever really wants to do. Uh, it's a diminution of your economic sovereignty, but we were faced with circumstances where we had absolutely no choice but to do that. So we did that in 2010, and we've been implementing that program, that bailout program, ever since. We are implementing, as I say, a very, very challenging budgetary adjustment of about, amounting to about 20% of our gross domestic product over the period 2008 to 2015. And most of this, I'm glad to say, has already been achieved. It has been an extraordinary, of course, this has ext inflicted extraordinary pain on people back at home. Uh, people have been extraordinarily worried about it. Um, uh, but the good news is that the consolidation, or the fiscal consolidation, which we have been obliged to do, is almost 80% uh, completed. And, um, but it has had the effect of affecting nearly every family in Ireland to the tune of almost 15,000 euros each per family in Ireland as a, in, 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 to, to, to find our way out of this uh, crisis. Somebody made a comparison recently that if the United States had done what we did over the last three years, four years, uh, in terms of fiscal cons consolidation, or you might prefer to call it austerity, call it what you want, um, but the, the, the effect is a uh, government cutback. If the United States had done uh, proportionately uh, similar to what we had done, this year the United States would be enjoying a budget surplus 
of $1.5 trillion. It gives you the extent of the adjustment that we have, we have made and have had to make. We didn't have much choice in the matter. The United States have, has a different set of economic and political levers or levers, as you would say. Uh, we, were, we, we did not have all those levers or levers. Uh, we were very much uh, dependent on the assistance of others. And in, uh, we had to follow this bailout program. And we have been loyally and dutifully doing that since. We've had nine reviews of the bailout program. And each of those reviews has found Ireland uh, faultless. So I'll say 85% of the necessary consolidation has been achieved. But of course, the difficulty is, as you get closer to the 100%, you get closer to, uh, to where it gets really, can get really very, very painful indeed. Uh, so it, it should not surprise you that the achievement of the last 15% is obviously an ongoing challenge. Our budget deficit has fallen from 30%, 30% in 2007, to 7.6% in 2012, a, a remarkable achievement. And we will achieve the target deficit of 3% of GDP by 2015. Not easily done, but we are on our way to achieving it. And after a long period of contraction, our economy is growing for the third consecutive year. We lost 11% of our economy over a three-year period between 2008 and 2011, but over the last three years, our economy has been growing again. This year, we're going to grow by about 1.6%, not stellar, but it's better than the alternative. Next year, we're expecting to grow by about 2.6%, and indeed, Ireland will be one of the best performing economies in the European Union in 2013. I'd say the figures aren't great to begin with, but insofar as there are figures there, Ireland will be among the better countries, having come uh, from a situation, as I said, three or four years back when the situation looked particularly disastrous. In fact, next year, or this year, Ireland will be the third fastest growing country in the European Union. Importantly, as a consequence, uh, the upside of the downside is that our competitiveness is up, we have achieved a 20% improvement in our competitiveness uh, in the period involved. We are now among the tw top 20 most competitive countries in the world. Ireland, in the period of the boom, and we had an extraordinary period of boom lasting something like 15 years in Ireland. But in the period of the, the boom, Ireland had also become a relatively expensive place, or let me just say, had become an expensive place. Um, but the, the consequence of the downturn has generated an improvement of about 20% in our competitiveness. And this is obviously going to make a difference, a big difference, as we're working our way back out uh, to economic growth and prosperity. Indeed, prices and costs have fallen back to 2003 levels in Ireland, which is a remarkable uh, fall uh, and obviously not, has had significant consequences. But it obviously augurs well in terms of our competitive capacity into the future. We still face many, many challenges. I don't want to give you the impression that, therefore, all is solved, all is not uh, solved. Uh, we have, um, our economy remains fragile, uh, but we're working to achieve outcomes which will ensure that our economy is sustainable into the future. But our successful phased return to the bond market is, of course, continuing. And international confidence in Ireland, once so shaken and given expression by the fact that we were shut out of that bond market, has now been restored and investors are showing new and renewed confidence in Ireland. So, if I tell you that at, the, at its worst, at its peak, Ireland was required, and of course could not, borrow money at about 14% for 10-year money, 14%, which is impossible for a country to borrow uh, money at. Today, Ireland can borrow money at 3.5%, less than 3.5%, which is actually almost at its historic lows of 2006. So we expect um, to emerge from the bailout program of 2010 later this year, and thus demonstrate, we hope, without being any way boastful, because God knows, you know, we have obviously, um, we have issues there which um, have caused us tremendous grief, but we hope to be able to demonstrate how a small country uh, beset uh, by a deep and uh, difficult crisis can, with the help of our international partners, the IMF, the ECB, and the EU, find a path back to stability and growth. So this would be an extraordinary uh, an extraordinarily positive thing for us if by the end of this year, the beginning of next year, we, will be able, we, we can stand on our own two feet economically again and borrow money in our own right on the, on the international bond market. We fully expect to be so, but of course we want to ensure that in, in reaching that point that we, are sufficiently, um, that we have sufficient equilibrium uh, to make sure that, that, um, that we can sustain that into the future. So we have obviously re-engineered some of our banking debt such that we have savings of something in the region of uh, $20 billion over the next 10 years. And we're in the business also of making further adjustments in some of the banking debt, which will help us also into the future. 
And as we continue uh, to work with our European colleagues to achieve, um, you know, to achieve all of these results, we are committed, of course, to banking your union in Europe and also the adoption of what's called a single, single supervisory mechanism. So new arrangements in Europe which will address some of the shortcomings that were identified in the course of this crisis, and not least in the banking area. So Ireland is committed to moving forward with our partners. We have a huge interest in ensuring that nothing like this ever visits Europe again. So we're working throughout the course of our presidency uh, to move forward the agenda in relation to a banking union which will protect us into the future. And as the global economy picks up, the pace of economic recovery in Ireland will also pick up. So as I said, if Ireland is growing this year by 1.6%, we'd like to be growing an awful lot stronger than that. To generate real jobs, generate better numbers of jobs, you really do have to be growing around at least 4% or thereabouts, uh, as the economists will tell you. But the trouble is, as we're swinging out of the, uh, the downside or the, the, the crisis, uh, we would wish very much that every other country was also you know, on the uptick as well. The trouble is, of course, that, is that the international economy, uh, the European economy in particular, the British economy, uh, which is very, very important to us, uh, they, are, they are relatively stagnant at the moment, and they're not growing as fast as we would ideally like them to be uh, in circumstances where we're on the upswing. If everybody else was upswinging as well, it would be a huge multiplier for us, and we would do very well, uh, very, very, um, um, we would do very well indeed. As a consequence, Ireland, you know, in all these circumstances, as I say, um, we would, never, we would never have wished them upon ourselves. Um, we are now, however, ranked number one in the world for availability of skilled labour, which is one of the key ingredients. If you ask inward investors, you know, what are the criteria uh, that they identify as being important for inward investment, the availability of skilled labour is always identified as a, as a key one. And Ireland is the number one, ranked number one in the world for the availability of such skilled labour. We're also ranked number one in the Eurozone for ease of doing business. Ireland is a country which is extraordinarily easy to do business in. Uh, we make it um, a red tape free environment to the extent that we can. And we're also the second most attractive country globally for the attraction of foreign direct investment. We have an extraordinary track record there and we think that's going to do even better, particularly in the context of enhanced competitiveness. You will not be surprised therefore to know that Ireland is home to more than 1,000 global companies and many of the world leaders in this sector, in sectors such as life science, ICT, financial services, and digital media are all in Ireland, and we're very proud of that. And of course, many of those are from here in the United States as well, Country, uh, major global companies looking for a foothold in Europe. They find that foothold in Ireland, and I would conf confidently assert that there is no better place in Europe to do business at the moment than in Ireland. So in Ireland, we have eight out of the 10 top ICT global companies are located in Ireland. Nine out of the top 10 pharma companies, pharmaceutical companies are located in Ireland. All of the largest online companies are all based in Ireland. And of course, many of these, as I said, originate here in the United States. 2012 saw the highest number of net new jobs in, mu in multinational companies in Ireland in 10 years. Inward investment in Ireland is the highest per capita in the European Union. And export sales from Ireland are now 16% higher than they were pre-crisis, and they are record levels. Ireland is a country that exports 80% of its GDP. We export nearly every single thing we produce. We export or we die. So we need to be very competitive and we need to export. So at the moment, our exports are doing extraordinarily well, driven partly by our indigenous companies, but also significantly uh, by the global companies of whom many are from here in the United States. And just some interesting facts, uh, just, uh, just, to, to, just to tell you, because perhaps you didn't know that Ireland is the second largest producer of computer software in the world, the eighth largest producer in the world of pharmaceuticals. 33% of the world's contact lenses are made in Ireland. So for those of you wearing contact lenses, uh, there's a fair chance that um, they were made in Ireland. 10% of the world's baby formula is made in Ireland. So if you've got a crying baby in Ireland or at home tonight um, and you're feeding baby formula, there's a 10% chance that, that was made in Ireland. We are an extraordinarily young population. 50% of our population is under 35 years of age and 60% of our population has higher third level education. As I said, Ireland exports 80% of everything we produce and sustaining and growing our exports is a key ingredient in securing economic recovery. The number of vehicles or levers that we have uh, to, to, to regrow our economy uh, isn't as many as you would have, as we share a currency so we don't have that to, 
uh, to work with as such. Um, the way we are going to get out of this recession, the way we're going to get out of this crisis is through exports and we're doing very, very well there and we obviously have to make sure that that continues. All in all, Irish exports of goods and services amount to something in the region of 177 billion euros exported to 200, 150 countries annually. That's about 200 billion euros of exports from a country that is only uh, comprises 4.5 million people. It's an extraordinarily high per capita uh, export um, uh, figure. We are an export country to an extraordinary degree. As I say, our return to growth is and will be led by exports. And the United States is our largest uh, merchandise and service trading partner with a combined value of exports here of something in the region of 40 billion a year. And in 2012, Ireland was the 14th biggest overseas supplier to the US ahead of Brazil and Russia. So little Ireland, uh, you know, I say with a relatively small population of four and a half million people, actually exports more uh, to the United States than either Brazil or Russia. And one very important point also in terms of uh, the focus of American interest in Ireland in terms of foreign direct investment. It is good to know, uh, it certainly is good for Ireland to know, that US investment in Ireland cumulatively amounts to something in the region of $200 billion, which is an extraordinary sum. In fact, the figure is so extraordinary, it's bigger than US investment in Brazil, Russia, India, and China combined. You know, so obviously we've done some things wrong, but we do some things right as well. Ireland remains, of course, a country that is extraordinarily tax efficient from, a, from a, a corporate point of view. And in fact, our tax rate for inward investors, in fact, for all investors is 12.5%, which is very, very competitive. It's one of the reasons why people invest there. It's not the only reason why people invest in, 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 in Ireland. Other reasons include, I would say, the skilled labor force, the fact that we're part of the euro area, the, part, the fact that we're part of, uh, of a community and a market of 500 million people in Europe. And uh, obviously, um, the tax rate is important. Uh, but it's not the only reason, but 12.5% is very competitive and very attractive. We are fully committed to maintaining Ireland's competitive advantage and working to further improve our FDI, uh, foreign direct investment friendly pro-business business environment. And is it any wonder, therefore, that we should wholeheartedly applaud the announcement recently that the European Union and the United States will open negotiations towards a new free trade agreement between the United States and Europe, the so-called TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Such a, new, uh, such a new partnership, such a new agreement is extremely good news for Ireland. It's also good news for the European Union and it's also good news for the United States and it is good for this transatlantic partnership as well between Europe and the United States. Ex advancing the external agenda, a trade agenda therefore features prominently in the Irish uh, presidency of the European Union and it's no secret that within the broader EU trade agenda Ireland has prioritized EU-US trade relations. The fact is that the EU and the US enjoy the most integrated economic relationship in the world. Our economies together account for something in the region of 50%, 5-0% of global gross domestic product, and for nearly one-third of world trade flows. We generate together some five trillion in total commercial sales a year. And the EU investment in the US is about eight times that of EU investment in India and China put together. An investment across the Atlantic from Europe has brought four times more jobs uh, to the United States than indeed the Trans-Pacific Partnership has done. And total US investment in the EU is three times that of all of Asia. And the Transatlantic Partnership relationship defined the shape of the global economy as a whole. So what we do both individually as, as, uh, as economic entities in Europe and in the United States, it matters. What we do together and what we can do together uh, certainly matters and will matter a huge uh, amount into the future. Either, either the EU or the US is the largest trade and investment partner for almost all other countries in the global economy. And it's therefore not surprising that releasing the further untapped potential of the EU-US trade relationship is what will provide the most benefit in terms of growth and jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. Our trade relationship has enormous potential, far right now from being fully realized. And we believe that with this new trade and investment um, agreement, which will be negotiated, we hope, from the beginning of July, that it will untap enormous benefits and probably generate at least one or two percent to our respective GDPs. And what that amounts to in the end of the day is, in the end of the day is jobs in Europe and jobs in America. In February, the European Council gave a strong endorsement to move the EU-US trade relationship forward to the next level. And a few days later, President Obama 
called for the launch of negotiations in a State of the Union address at the end of January. There will be difficult bridges to cross in the negotiations, but I am convinced that if both sides take up an open and flexible approach, we will be able to agree, to agree on a new trade relationship between our two major economic blocks, which will make a huge difference to our people and to our economies, and will also send a very, very strong signal of leadership to other economic powers around the world, because the truth about the matter is that unless Europe and the United States set the standards into the future, those standards will be set by somebody else. So we either do it together or somebody else is going to do it for us. So we believe this is a good time uh, for us to sit down and negotiate uh, this initiative. Ireland as presidency salute this initiative and we look forward to the opening of negotiations within the next two months. I'd like to conclude on that basis just by saying um, it's a privilege, uh, you know, to, as I say, to uh, represent one's country as ambassador. It's an extra privilege to do so in the capacity of our, our membership of the European Union. But it's a particular privilege, obviously, to do so here in the United States where we have such extraordinary uh, connections. And it's only when you come to out and about that you realize uh, or have reinforced to you how extraordinary those connections were. Last month we had St. Patrick's Day. In fact, it seems like St. Patrick's Month. It goes on forever. Uh, but um, so if we have 40 million people in the United States claiming Irish ancestry, during the month of March, that figure, I'm sure, goes up to about 100 million. Uh, <laughs> At other times of the year, it may wane back again, but we are very, very committed and devoted to trying to protect this link that we have, this extraordinary link that we have between Ireland and its global family. And here in the United States, there is no more, our global family, our, our, uh, our diaspora, is of extraordinary importance and significance. They've reached every corner of this society. They've achieved every success in this society. We are extremely proud of that success. And we want to ensure that as the generations go by, uh, that we find new and perhaps also more innovative ways of, of connecting with this diaspora and ensuring that we can perpetuate this into the future um, uh, as best we can. So I'd like to just conclude, conclude with, a, with an invitation for those of you who are Irish and uh, maybe also for those of you who are not Irish uh, but might have aspirations to being Irish. And this is the year, and speaking about these connections, this is the year of what we call the Gathering of 2013. Uh, this is a year where we're making an extra effort uh, to reach out to our global family because if we've got 40 million people in the United States who have an Irish background, we've got another 30 million, 30 million ex uh, elsewhere in the world. So that's 70 million in our global family. That's a very big family. Uh, and we're trying to find new uh, ways of, of connecting. So this year, being 2013, is the year of the gathering. We want as many of those 70 million, not all together, but as many as we can get, uh, to come back and visit Ireland and to reconnect uh, with Ireland and for Ireland to reconnect with with you and with, with them as well uh, in new and innovative ways. So if you go on to the website, The Gathering of 2013, it's got all sorts of ideas as to how you might do that. I want to just say that in doing so, you will be extended a, what we would say, a Cade Mila Fáilte, which is 100,000 welcomes. You will be an extraordinary, extraordinarily welcome. We want to be connected with our global family. We want to stay connected with our global family, and we want to assure uh, that connection into the future. Thank you very much indeed. Take some questions. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Amy Schmidt. I'm an economics professor here. And uh, I'm wondering if you would call Ireland an austerity success story and what you think about the future of austerity given the recent discrediting of the Reinhardt Rogoff paper uh, on debt and austerity. Well, um, you know, austerity obviously is a very contentious word. and. Um, um, it should be clear that, that we have uh, adopted a policy which amounts to a policy of austerity, uh, not out of any ideological um, predisposition towards policies of that nature. Uh, in our case, we didn't have a choice. It was this, or we you know, could not find the money to sustain our economy. So it's not as if um, ideologically the political parties in Ireland are, you know, have, a, have, a, have a, a thoroughgoing belief uh, that austerity is the way to go. We have had to, nonetheless, make corrections in our economy to bring it into a line. We were, we were out of kilter. Uh, we had to bail out our banks. We had to find money from somewhere. And of course, uh, finding that money from somewhere uh, involved conditions. There were terms and conditions attached uh, to the receipt of that money. Uh, so the choices weren't ours. Um, 
the effect, of course, is the same. I mean, we have had to, uh, people have had to endure pain, a huge pain, a huge loss, a huge amount of worry, a uh, huge amount of concern. Um, you're absolutely right. There's even more, even in recent days, the whole question of austerity, right or wrong, uh, is again back in, in, in vogue uh, as, 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 as a topic and subject. The debate goes on. Uh, but, uh, you know, the truth about the matter is we hope that we can, um, as I say, emerge from the particular program which involves so much austere uh, measures, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, the, for Irish people in the, in the reasonably short term, and that therefore we will have perhaps, as a consequence, more, uh, more, more instruments and more choices uh, whereby we can determine how exactly to manage our economy. But, I mean, we do have a commitment, nonetheless, uh, to secure a deficit, a uh, budget deficit of 3% by 2015. That's part of the euro rules. Uh, we're committed to that, and we are committed to achieving that, however painful it is. But it's a source, nonetheless, that remains, it's a subject that remains highly contentious, not just here in the United States, but also in Europe, and of course in Ireland too. But I would say simply to you, austerity is not a, an ideological choice for Ireland. It, is a, it, is, it, is a, it arose in a particular set of circumstances in which we had no choice. Does Ireland have any say in austerity measures, say in Spain or Greece, the other countries, or uh, you're not you're not a creditor nation, are you? In no, we're we're a debtor nation. Right, right. But I mean, you don't hold any. Greek no, I mean or the the, the, the rules the rules for us have been set down by the European Central Bank, the IMF, and they determine what the rules are. They say you have to have the target for this year. In fact, the target for this year in terms of um, a debt GDP uh, ratio was. Um, uh, the budget deficit, sorry, was, was 8.6. We're coming in at 7.6. We're way ahead of the target. You might say, and this, of course, gives rise to another debate. Do we really have to be, can we not ease up the brake a little bit? I mean, can we not, can we not maybe just um, uh, relax a little bit? Uh, they, they're all big political decisions. They're not for, for me, obviously, and they will arise, of course, in the context of our budget in the, in the autumn time. Uh, but, I mean, our goal, our goal is to be out the other side of this and to be, as a consequence, um, a country that can grow again very, very strongly. You know, with, despite the fact that nobody would ever wish to find in this, themselves in this situation, the fact is uh, we did recognize our circumstances or they were recognized for us uh, at a very early stage. So in, that, in some senses, we've had a head start uh, and that, that we, we've, we've done measures that perhaps other countries are only beginning to recognize that they also need to do and are only beginning to do so now. Uh, Ambassador. Um, I, don't, I don't purport to speak for the entire ancient order of Hibernians in America, but um, as a member, uh, you grace us with your presence in New Hampshire, thank and you. we sincerely thank you for doing that. <clears throat> the second comment is, uh, for your next visit, which we hope you will schedule, um, there's also a Dublin and Antrim in New Hampshire, <laughs> in addition to Londonderry and Derry. Oh, he's making a note. <laughs> uh, and, and purely from an economic point of view, there are two questions. One is, uh, in the current scenario, tourism represents uh, what aggregate portion of, let's say, the revenue pouring into Ireland? And the second question is, uh, looking to the future and to 2016, from an economic point of view, does the government envision an economic uh, boon from the 100th anniversary of the 16 rising. And, and I don't mean certainly security and other issues that are very important. I guess I'm just talking about from an economic point of view. And thank you. Well, thank you. Um, you know, we, um, tourism is an extraordinarily important part of, of our economy. And um, one of the reasons the gathering is so important is, and having spoken about inward investment and um, given you all the facts and figures there, it takes a while for inward, inward investment to take full effect. I mean, so in other words, if somebody commits uh, to an inward investment today, it could be several years down the line before the, the full benefits of that, valuable and all as they are, would become manifest. Tourism, is, tourism involves an immediate injection of, 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 of revenue into the economy. So every additional tourist we can get uh, it makes a big, big difference to us. So I haven't got all the figures, but we, 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 um, we have about, uh, I think, something in the region of uh, um, uh, a million uh, tourists from the United States every year, uh, which is uh, significant. Uh, and we're hoping to increase that by about 10%, I think, you know, through the gathering or thereabouts. Uh, next to, we're looking for an extra 300,000 people overall in the gathering. But um, so all of that would make a difference. Uh, an immediate difference. So if people come in this year, the money will be spent this year, and that's going to obviously affect our economy. So uh, it, tourism is, is relevant. But, but if I tell you it's relevant, but just to give you 
you know, the biggest earners for Ireland today. You know, a lot of people associate Ireland with agriculture, and indeed Ireland is a very uh, significant agriculture, but the agriculture, uh, agriculture as a part of our economy is, is something less than 4%, maybe about, maybe about 3%. So 97% of everything Ireland does is not agriculture at all. So what is it? Uh, the, m the single most important thing we produce in Ireland, our single biggest um, export is pharma, pharmaceuticals. I, I gave you the figures there earlier on. The pharma pharmaceuticals are huge. The second biggest thing we produce in Ireland is ICT, in, in information and communication technology, uh, 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 software of all that type. And the third thing we produce uh, is, is financial services. The three biggest things we have going for us in Ireland, um, pharma, ICT, financial services. So not things you normally, a lot of people would associate with Ireland. Now tourism is there somewhere, but it's, you know, it's obviously further down the list. So Ireland as an economy has changed e enormously over the years. Uh, tourism, is, uh, tourism and agriculture are still very important parts of it, but they're the three big uh, earners for us uh, at the current time. We would hope by 2016, uh, you know, uh, 2016 for those of you who know is, is, uh, is, um, is the anniversary of the uh, uh, 1916 uh, uprising. A uh, very significant time. In fact, this whole period in Ireland, the period from this year right through to tw 1922, is a period of what we, what we call commemoration. Any number of things happened. We had we had the rising of 1916. We had major uh, union lockouts in, in, in 1913. Uh, we had our, our our war of independence, of course, uh, uh, leading through 1919. Uh, and of course, tragically, we had our civil war. Uh, after independence in 1921 uh, to 1923. So uh, just to make a, a slightly digressive point, I mean, for us, capturing in an appropriate way how we commemorate these, this very, very sensitive time in Irish politics and in the life of our relatively young country is something that we're devoted to assuring is done in a way that's sensitive and that, that, that will propel us forward in a very positive way uh, for the next 100 years. We would hope that our boom would arrive long before 19, 2016. Uh, can't exactly say when it will arise, uh, but um, uh, we, we, we are, I'll say, confidently hoping uh, that, that uh, you know, before that time, that Ireland will again have regained its economic footing and be booming in a, in a way that's sustainable into the future. We don't want a boom of the type that caused us grief. Uh, which was focused on property, which was focused on, on speculative development. Uh, we want a boom that's sustainable into the future, and that's the type of economy we're seeking to build out of, out of, out of uh, you know, some of the disaster that visited us uh, uh, over the last number of years. Please. Uh, yes, you spoke about various uh, links that the two countries have, but there was one that perhaps you'd be interested in. Uh, a number of years ago, not too many, uh, for a few years, the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire and the diocese, the Anglican Diocese of Limerick and Killaloo had a companionship and it was very successful, lots of good links and uh, lots of good friendships were made then. And it also included a three-way with the Diocese of Quebec. So yeah, just good. thought you'd be interested. Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, we in New Hampshire talk about our New Hampshire advantage, referencing uh, our almost bottom low tax burden on a per capita basis. We have no income tax, we have no sales tax, a VAT as, as you call it in Ireland. You referenced um, the low corporate tax rate in Ireland at 12.5% and I understand that that's probably a large explanation for the sizable presence of the multinationals and the three f sectors that dominate the Irish economy. I recall not too long ago, France was taking umbrage about that. They didn't like the Ireland advantage. Um, in the light of the rather heavy-handed effort by the European Union to change the banking system in Cyprus, do you have a renewed fear that maybe the Irish advantage may have its days numbered? Uh, no. Uh, Glad to uh, hear it. <laughs> you know, we're, we're a very determined people and a very resilient people. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, each of these circumstances is somewhat different. I mean, Cyprus is one case, Greece is another case, Portugal is another case. And, you know, one of the things people do, tend to do is they conflate the various economic experiences in Europe. And uh, uh, that, of course, is erroneous. Um, and, of course, th there are also countries that are doing extraordinarily well. Um, um, uh, you know, but just to, to give you an example of how divergent, I mean, some of these economies are, if I tell you, and I did say, 
that Ireland exports 80 to 85% of what it produces. Uh, Greece exports 30%. So the vehicle whereby they're going to exit from this uh, crisis is clearly going to be a different vehicle than the one that we're uh, travelling on. So that's uh, very much to our advantage. But the tax rate, the tax rate is a sovereign choice. Uh, and, um, you know, you're absolutely right. There was a little bit of... Uh, um, uh, more than a little bit of an effort by some uh, of our, our, our colleagues in Europe, you know, maybe to suggest that, that was a, now was a time, or then was a time, two years ago, for us to uh, bring our uh, tax rate, our corporate tax rate, more in line with the European average or the European norm, which is way up there in the late 20s, 20, 30 percent. We have absolutely no intention of doing that, absolutely none. So uh, if there's one abiding message that I'd like to convey uh, to each and every one of you, and particularly those who, <laughs> who maybe... Um, Prospective inward investors is the 12.5% rate is fixed. It's a sovereign choice. Um, and sometimes, you know, other countries can be a bit disingenuous about their rate as well because they might say that the headline rate is, is one thing. Sometimes the actual rate uh, can, be, uh, can be not terribly dissimilar to our own. But for us, 12.5% is it. It's, it's been a key ingredient in our industrial uh, strategy uh, for the last uh, many, many, many years. And, of course, there's nothing to stop everybody harmonising their tax rate, but at the lower level, we've no intention of harmonising up. They, they, they're welcome to harmonise down. But I should just say also that, that the tax thing is very, very important. I mean, clearly, it's, uh, the tax strategy uh, that corporations have is, is something that they're, each, each corporation and each uh, you know, shareholders you know, require uh, companies to be tax efficient. But it is not the only reason why people come to Ireland, because there are lots of other countries that offer you know, pretty pretty competitive tax rates as well. Indeed, there are countries that offer even less than we do. Uh, you know, uh, uh, but, I mean, so there are other things alongside that which make Ireland attractive. And it's those other things and all combined, really, that are determined, are the determinants by, uh, the, 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 for, 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 for investment. And I say not the least of which is skilled labour. Uh, and uh, so uh, the presence in the euro um, uh, area, the 500 million uh, consumers, uh, the euro also just... Uh, and unambiguous, as I said, commitment to the European Union. We're not going anywhere. We're staying in Europe. So inward investors know that as well, so that's important. But I'd say, um, any, any, um, uh, the, thankfully, those efforts or that, that clamour in relation to our tax rate has, has abated, and abated for very good reason, because they know we have absolutely no intention of changing it. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm Abdelaziz. I'm an uh, economics student here. And... Uh, you had a lot of links between the U.S. and the European Union that one of them, I found it very interesting. You said, like, if the U.S. had the same policies as the European Union, the U.S. going to have 1.5 trillion. No, same as Ireland. Ireland, yeah. So do you think that uh, if the U.S. had the same policies, was this going to be better than the payoffs that the U.S. is going to make it? At least the U.S. right now is getting out of, uh, the U.S. got out of the recession although it's a slow growth rate, but it got out. So what do you think if they didn't do this, if they didn't run a huge deficit? Well, you know, I mean, you know, we w you know it's, it wouldn't be for me um, as an ambassador either representing my, my own country or representing the European Union uh, to just enter the debate here in terms of what is right for America. I mean, you, you people, uh, the, the taxpayers of the United States, the... the, the the voters of the United States are the people who determine that. I mean, what is the appropriate um, the balance in your government? What's the appropriate mix? What's the appropriate choice of politics? You know, each country, and, and uh, you know, and, and, and whether it's Ireland or whether it's the European Union, uh, has to do what, what it sees uh, as best in, in the circumstances. I'd say I've just described, described the particular set of circumstances that w we faced. Uh, and we, had a, uh, we, we didn't have, a, as I said earlier on, a, a great number of choices to make. Uh, the United States has an entirely different range of choices to make. Everything from, from you know, the fact that you uh, have a currency which is your own, uh, or we share a currency, uh, to the fact that you've got the broadest economic shoulders uh, on the globe. I mean, America uh, has, has, has extraordinary capacity. So, uh, you know, I mean, I know the debate here uh, can get uh, fractious, um, and, uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's something that we, we observe, uh, certainly don't, and certainly don't do anything more than observe. Yeah. Thanks for coming to New Hampshire, Ambassador. My name is Brian Henchy from Boston. I have a comment and then two questions. Uh, the comment is, first of all, uh, when you repeated uh, saying that 80% of Ireland's GDP is exported, honestly, I was expecting you to say 79% of that is uh, Guinness. But um, <laughs> that being aside, I, I was actually surprised to hear what the leading uh, exports are. But that being said, um, 
With respect to uh, Ireland's competitiveness in the world economically, I was wondering uh, what you see as being uh, the countries that are the biggest competitors out there to Ireland uh, in terms of um, how great their tax rate is uh, as well as their skilled labor. And the other, other question uh, is about, uh, I, I had a roommate who is from uh, Leitrim and uh, he actually talked about how uh, he claimed that lots of corporations have incredible influence over the government because at any time, uh, if corporations don't get the laws that they want in Ireland, they're able to threaten that they're gonna remove jobs from the country uh, on a major scale. Uh, I don't know how true that is, but I was wondering if you could please comment on that. Thank you. Well, uh, just a, a second part first, I'm sure it's not true. <laughs> um, but but having, having said that, I mean, we, we have a very close uh, relationship between um, our inward investors. We, we obviously engage with them. We, we, uh, we, we work in very close um, collaboration with them. If they have a problem, we want, we want to know that they have a problem. If they've got something that's affecting the investment in Ireland, I mean, we want to know about it before it becomes a problem affecting uh, the choice to move the factory from Ireland. Of course, that would be a natural part and a prudent part of any um, any, any government to, to adopt that position. So we have a, an intensive relationship, particularly through our Industrial Development Authority and these various inward investors. It's not a threatening relationship. I mean, these global companies, I mean, they're by definition mobile. Uh, they do have choices. Uh, they've made a choice to come to Ireland. Uh, we, we need to assure them that that they've made the right choice and that there are difficulties that arise from time to time that we address them. And these can be difficulties of an absolutely bona fide nature, uh, which, which can be addressed, but they can't be addressed if we don't know that it's a problem. So we do, um, we do, we do uh, work very, very closely. We like to believe also that uh, access, uh, because of the small scale of Ireland, but because of all the, also the, the way in which we do it, access by inward investments, inward investors to decision makers in Ireland is completely open and easy. It is one of the great strengths we have. You can get to the decision makers uh, in pretty quick order, obviously in a transparent way. I'm, I'm not suggesting anything else. But one of the great things is the accessibility and as a consequence, you know, uh, uh, therefore responsiveness, appropriate responsiveness uh, on the issues from time to time. In terms of competitiveness out there, it is a very, very competitive world. So Ireland has to fight very hard for what it does, what it achieves, what it, uh, what it gains, particularly in relation to foreign uh, direct investment. For us, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, our, our, our biggest competitors, uh, believe it or not, uh, for the type of things that we are primarily interested in, and as I say, it's kind of the high-end stuff, uh, generally speaking, um, it tends to be the case, from what I understand, uh, that countries that are at the table or the choices are generally um, kind of boiled down uh, to uh, Ireland, uh, Switzerland, and Singapore. You know, they are the kind of, the, that's the kind of the environment that for in terms of inward investors uh, where, where we tend to reside. Like, so you're, you're talking about pharma, uh, ICT, um, um, and obviously uh, financial services, and others as well. So they're, they would be our big competitors. But interestingly, in the, of, that, of, the, of those three, Ireland is the only one in the European Union. Of course, Switzerland is not, and of course, uh, nor is Singapore. But it's very competitive out there. Uh, but, but generally speaking, um, you know, um, you know uh, Singapore and Switzerland, they also are, 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 are mightily uh, competitive in what they do. And uh, obviously, they've got a huge track record. So we have to stay awake and be very, very nimble uh, to make sure that we get what we think uh, is our fair share. Please. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Collins. My name is David Wall. I'm a graduate of St. Anselm College, a member of that 40 million with very deep roots in counties Carlow and Waterford. My question is, uh, you mentioned that the IMF, and I presume the European Union, basically set down the rules for Ireland's recovery. Mm -hmm. How effective do you think those bodies will be in inducing some of your other states, such as Spain, Italy, and, and Greece, to adopt the same uh, measures of austerity and recovery? Well, there, there are currently programs in relation to Greece. Greece was the first program. Um, Ireland was the second program. Um, Portugal was the third program. Uh, Cyprus is the fourth program. Um, now, each of those programs is different, um, uh, but, but each of them is designed to achieve, uh, and each of these countries you know, is coming at it with, with different levels of problem. Obviously, problems. Greece is one thing. Um, uh, as, as I explained to you earlier on, Portugal is something else, and, um, and, and Cyprus is something else. And then there are countries that are there 
uh, as you mentioned, maybe Slovenia, maybe um, um, Spain, maybe Italy, all of whom have their own challenges. But I, I, th I think, I mean, the idea of the IMF and the e e e ECB and, and, and uh, the EU is to uh, design, I presume, a program that's appropriate to each country's uh, set of circumstances. But, um, but, but in a way, obviously, that also obliges that country uh, to face up to the realities uh, that, that are actually there. So uh, in our case, uh, that, that involved you know, coming to a proper identification uh, of the scale of the banking bailout that was required, uh, a proper identification of uh, the, you know, the level of public service, um, uh, uh, the, you know, public monies that needed to be, to be found. And I think um, you know, uh, there really, therefore, is no, um, there's no hiding place within those programs. And they come back every three months. They literally come back every three months and they check the boxes, and uh, if you've achieved your goals, you get your money. If you haven't achieved your goals, well, obviously, it goes into a different level of discussion. But um, so, as I say, we would be uh, hope to, hope to be to be out of that program in the next um, six to six to eight months. Uh, other countries, maybe it's going to take a little bit slower because they maybe are in a somewhat different set of circumstances than we find ourselves in, and maybe the, the hole that they're in is somewhat deeper. Uh, but. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just uh, an extraordinary situation uh, that, that we find ourselves uh, having had to, in, case, in the case of Ireland, having had to, um, uh, you know, ad adopt this program. It's the first time ever in our history that we had to do so. Uh, it's something that no country chooses to do unless it really has to. But as I said to you earlier on, uh, we had uh, no choice in the matter, and for that matter, uh, nor had uh, Cyprus, uh, nor had Greece, and nor had Portugal. The other countries that you mentioned, uh, Spain and Portugal, Spain and, and, and Italy, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure where they are in the scheme of things at the moment. Each of the, those countries is challenged in its own particular way. But I should just say, as I said earlier on, that the European Union comprises 27, shortly to be 28 countries. Not every one of those countries is, is, ha has a similar uh, problem. Uh, but in our own case, we had a problem which we faced up to, and we like to believe, despite the Irish kind of poetic way, uh, that, that we, we, were, we, we, uh, we did so in a way which was realistic which is pragmatic and which is pretty resilient. And in the end, we believe that we will, despite the pain, that we will emerge you know, uh, with an economy that can grow into the future. Why don't we make this the final question? Is that all right? I, I'm not sure you want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, Father Jerome from the Department of English here at St. Anselm. Um, I just want to stretch it out a little bit beyond the economic. Um, I have two questions. One concerns numbers, 26 and 32 numbers that are very important to the American uh, Irish community. And they concern in particular something that Ireland actually doesn't get a vote on, but has and will have an effect on it. There is scheduled, I believe, a referendum in Scotland on Scotland's continued participation in the United Kingdom. And my question is, if that referendum is a positive one, if it, in terms of a, a yes vote that, they, that Scotland step out of the UK, what is the Irish government's position with regard to the north of Ireland? How, how is that going to complicate uh, or liberate the situation uh, in the north, which is historically desirous of being part of the UK, which effectively would be a very different reality? The other question I have is, is quite different. It's just a, you're a, a representative of the Irish government, but you're also a member of Irish society. I'd just be intrigued to hear your s take on the terrible consequences of the clergy abuse scandal as it unfolded in Ireland and what you think the, uh, the prospects are. I had the opportunity to do a paper a while back on Archbishop Martin in Dublin and find him to be very uh, effective and very interesting uh, ecclesiastical figure. So two questions, one political and one um, sociological. How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Morning prayer doesn't start till six. That's oh, okay, okay. <laughs> By the way, I looked at your, your, your background. I was uh, impressed to see that it was BlackRock, disappointed that it didn't say Glenn Stahl. Well, um, well, so was I, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, my, my kids have, have, have visited Glenstall, and, and I've never been in Glenstall, but they, they, they genuinely say there's, there's nowhere like it, um, genuinely say that. So um, uh, what can I do? Um, just uh, just on, on uh, you know, the, you mentioned the Scottish referendum, the, the, your first question, and, and, and the complications that would arise, or the, the issues that arise. I mean, there, there is a, a rather complicated uh, environment generally around uh, Britain at the moment, um, and... Uh, 
uh, to do with Scotland and, and, and the, the, the question of a referendum there. And uh, I really can't you know, actually speculate, I'm not an expert on Scottish politics, to know what the prospects are of a referendum being carried. I mean, some people say, you know, some people say uh, that, that that may not be in prospect. I simply don't know the answer to that. Um, and there are a lot of issues yet to be debated out there. I see even most recently they're debating issues in relation to the currency, all sorts of things like that. So it would be, um, it, it's a very complicated environment, coupled with, of course, a commitment by, uh, by David Cameron to have a referendum on, on, on Britain in or out of the Euro 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 European Union uh, in 2007, but the referendum in 2017. So you've got a very complicated scenario there of where you've got a Britain, whether Britain in terms of, um, you know, first of all, does it include Scotland, does it not include Scotland? Uh, are they in the Euro Union or are they not going to be in the Union or what's the nature of their relationship uh, going to be um, in, in those circumstances? Uh, uh, very, very complicated and it really is, um, it's, hard to, it's, it's very hard to fathom. So let me just bring it back home, uh, back to Ireland, if I may, and uh, to say, you know, uh, of course this resonates a little bit in Ireland, but I wouldn't exaggerate the extent, I mean, the, bit, the business about Britain maybe pulling out of the European Union certainly resonates in Ireland. We do not want to see Britain pull out of the European Union. We want a strong Britain in a strong Europe, and we want that to be the case. So, I mean, th that would be our, obviously it's a matter for the British people, but Europe is better to have a strong, a strong union, and I think the United, a, a strong Britain in it, and I think the United States position is the same as well. I mean, they were very forceful in, in, in articulating that that is the way the Americans really uh, see Britain's future as well as a strong voice uh, in Europe. Bringing it back to Ireland then, uh, uh, in terms of Northern Ireland, um, uh, you know, I, I would simply say this, uh, that is that we are, we achieved by referendum um, uh, uh, support overwhelmingly for the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, which is a landmark agreement which allowed for peace and partnership in Ireland. That is the agreement that we're operating under. So people can paint, and sometimes do paint, uh, lots of alternative scenarios. And uh, there, are, there are scenarios also painted within the Good Friday Agreement in terms of uh, United Ireland or whatever uh, by, by consent. But I think the priority for us at the moment, and we would not like to see uh, that being uh, distracted from, is to ensure that that agreement is given every opportunity you know, to bed in, bed down, and succeed. We need uh, to... Uh, to, um, to, to, uh, to ensure that an agreement that's only 15 years in existence, that in fact has only been fully operational since 2007, that it's given, given every chance to succeed and see where that brings us in terms of the healing uh, that needs to take place in that society. Northern Ireland was a devastated society. To give you some idea of the scale of that devastation, again, proportionately, if proportionately, um, you know, uh, bringing it back to the United States, and I, I frequently say this, that the Vietnam Wall in uh, Washington, D.C. would need to be five times longer and to accommodate five times more names proportionately to get an idea of the scale of the loss, uh, I'm talking about the killings in Northern Ireland, over an almost equivalent period of the Vietnam War, duration-wise, to get an idea of the scale of what happened in Northern Ireland. So. When we achieve peace and we achieve the Good Friday Agreement as we have done, we're in the business of protecting that agreement in every way we can. We're in the business of allowing the communities under that canopy, which the, the political canopy uh, that the Good Friday Agreement provides, uh, provides for a very divided society, a fractured, divided society. As I say, some of them aspiring, some aspiring to United Ireland, some aspiring, obviously, to maintaining, the majority aspiring to maintaining the link with Britain. Uh, we're in the business of uh, through the Good Friday Agreement, allowing the partnership that that agreement uh, provides for, allowing that partnership to develop in every way we can. And I say the agreement doesn't exclude any options for the future, but our priority at the moment is to make sure that we implement what's been agreed and we implement it fully. So what's happening in Scotland, what's happening in Britain, you know, th that obviously is, is, uh, uh, is a source of considerable interest. Our priority, of course, is to protect you know, what we've achieved, and it was a, a huge achievement uh, for, for Northern Ireland and for Ireland and for, for between Britain and Ireland to get the outcome that we have and as I say we need to protect that come what